A promise is a pledge to provide a service. I'm not promising you'll be entertained. I'm not promising we're the best show in town. What I am promising is to teach you biblical truth with practical application. I promise to teach men to fight for their faith, their families, and their futures through the word of God. I'm Douglas Gumby, lead pastor of the Contenders Church. Join us in the fight at contenderschurch.org. Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, verses 41 through 44 says this, And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet, and he besought him that he would come to his house. For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood staunched. Father, I bless you. God, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. My prayer today, God, is simply move Doug Gumby out of the way. I prepared a lot of different things. I, I had a lot of great thoughts to me, but God, if it wasn't what you want me to say, if it's not your will for me to declare, you control my tongue, you control my thoughts, you control my mind. I yield to you and your Holy Spirit as we move forth. Bless your people, enrich your people by the word. Allow us to not only hear the word, but to understand the word that we can proclaim the word to a lost generation. We honor you for this day. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Let, let me ask you a question. And I want, I want to start this off with a question. Can you tell the difference between a coincidental occurrence and God's providential plan? Do we have trouble trying to figure out, well, maybe it was a coincidence or maybe it was God's providence. Maybe it just happened or was supposed to happen in this, in this place. In truth, most of us, are oblivious to God's providential plans because we are too overwhelmed by the events of the circumstance. Citing an occurrence as coincidence is how we as humans explain unexpect, unexpected events and surprise meetings. But I want to say this to you, and I want you to remember this if you don't remember anything else I say today. Just because you are taken by surprise does not mean God ever was. We tend to approach the subject of coincidence and God's providence with a glass half empty, glass half full mentality. We, 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 we see the good in it, but we see the not so good in it. We should remember this. Scripture says this, and I want to insert these words. All things work coincidentally and providentially together for the good of them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Today, I want to discuss the perfect timing of two coincidental 12-year issues with the providential Savior. For the time that is ours to share, I want to speak from this topic, the 12-year issue. Three things I want to give you, and I, I promise to soon be out of your way. Uh, I want to I want to bless you today, and I want you to be enriched by the word. The, third, the first of three things that I want to share with you, in order to understand the 12 year issue that most of us are, are have dealt or are dealing with, is that you have been you have been given providential parental placement. I, I, I'm in this in this series, I'm looking at the family. In this series, I, I want to say that, that most of the time we come to church and we want to be blessed spiritually. We want to be blessed in a, in, a, in a manner that we feel like God is doing something for us. But most of us fall short of looking for blessings because we don't take care of home. I, I, I'll say this, Al, to you because we, we get the bad rap. Uh, as, as preachers, we are in front of folk and we touch people's lives and then our children are the ones who are, are, are noted as the, the PKs or the worst of the bunch. 
And the truth of the matter is, they're basically doing what they see everybody else doing, but they just don't know how to get away with half of it. Right? So here we are. I believe that God providentially places, parent, places parents in place to make sure that our children are brought up in the way that they should be. In Luke chapter 8, verses 41 and 42, it says this, And behold, there came a man named Jairus. He was a ruler of the synagogues, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come to his house. For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay dying. But as he went, the people enthronged him. You, you can learn a lot uh, about a man when his family is involved. Men, we don't, we don't say a whole lot. We, we're very quiet. You know, we, we handle the bills. We handle the things. We, we, we're fixing things, and we're trying to maintain and, and maintenance everything. But at the end of the day, you will find out where a man stands if you mess with his home. I'm the nicest person you ever want to meet. But don't mess with my wife. Don't mess with my children. Don't mess with my income. You got a whole nother animal to deal with. I'm saved and I love the Lord. But them, them three issues right there, God's still working on me. Just stretch your hands this way. I know what I feel when, I come, when it comes to my wife. I know how I feel when it comes to my daughters. I, I know how I feel when it comes to my son. When, when a man's family is affected, you will see a rare glimpse of him struggling to either add water to the glass or take some out to balance things out. We have here a man, a man who is connected to an organization, a man who is connected to an organization who is strictly opposed to Christ. You have here a man who is connected to an organization who is strictly opposed to Christ, but he desperately wants to save his daughter's life. Now, a lot of times we have two miracles coincidentally interwoven here in Luke and also in Mark and, and Matthew, uh, the raising of Jairus' daughter to life and the curing of the woman with an issue of blood. We focus on the issue so much that we simply miss this important fact that this father would rather trade places with his daughter than see her suffer. We overlook that. We, we, so, we, so we are, we are, a, 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 a group of people, we are a society of people who are focused on issues. We, we got, we got folk who don't want to believe Christianity because some folk believe that we teach a, a white Christ. We, we got folk that don't want to talk church because we got, we got folk that have issue with where the money goes. We got folk that, we, we are an issue-based society and we're focused on the issue rather than resolving what the issues are. This father, he, was, he, he had reached a point that he didn't care anymore. It wasn't that he didn't have the ability to care. It's just that the people he had cared about caring, he no longer cared what they thought. Somebody catch that tomorrow. Somebody need to catch it today. Because some of us are walking around in life and we have not moved forward, but because we are so concerned with what other folk think about our decisions that don't affect them anyway. I, I, I'll be the first. You won't say it. I see you shaking your head, but I'll go ahead and admit mine. There have been things in my life, decisions in my life, or uh, places that I should have gone, but I was worried about what this group of folk. This father was not concerned anymore with his profession. He was a ruler of the synagogues. He was not concerned anymore with personal opinion. The, the rulers of the synagogue had a beef with Jesus because he came and didn't choose none of them. This father was not concerned with who knew he was seeking Jesus. Scripture tells us that, uh, behold, a man named Jairus, uh, he was a ruler of the synagogue. He fell down publicly at Jesus' feet. 
Why did he fall down publicly at Jesus' feet? Because no matter, at the end of the day, when it comes down to what you love, when it boils down to who you love, you're willing to do whatever it takes to see. Now, the rulers of the synagogue had a problem with Jesus. They had a beef with Jesus. He did things that, were, that was un unorthodox. They didn't like the fact that he broke what their rules declared. But you don't understand that the one you say broke the rules was the rule. You'll catch that one tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay dying. But as he went, as Jesus decided to follow uh, Jairus to his house, the people pressed in. And as they pressed in, uh, they, 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 they crowded him. He wasn't able to move. Here we are. I want you to know this. When you have providential parental placement, it's no coincidence that you have been given children the parents that you have been given. Whether they were good parents and the glass was half full or whether they were not so good and your glass was half empty, God knew exactly what you needed to get you where you are. Help me, Holy Ghost. The 12-year issue has built within it the providential parental placement. Not only does it have the providential parental placement, but it has a self-preserving structure. It has a, with it a self-preserving structure. Luke chapter 8 and verse 42, the second part, no, 43, excuse me. Uh, and the woman, and a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood staunched. I, I want to say this, looking from a parental perspective, uh, every, the goal of every parent should be to prepare your children physically, mentally, and spiritually. We do well on physically. We do okay on mentally, but we fail when it comes to spiritually. There has to be a balance across the board. There has to be a teaching to our children. This ain't in my notes, just, just for you. Uh, there has to be a teaching to our children about who God is and how important he is. If all your children know is the latest Jordans are coming out, then their glass is half empty. But if they know who God is as their Lord and Savior, then their glass is half full. You can fill your child with the right, wrong stuff and have the worst case scenario pop up. That's why when our children are out here killing folk in the street, we say that our children are not capable. The devil is a lie. They are capable. They wouldn't be capable if you taught them who they were physically. If they taught them who they were mentally. If you taught them who they were spiritually and you balanced their lives. I didn't come to holler at you this morning. Forgive me for that. Par parents must, must teach their children to handle various obstacles that life will continually throw their way. You cannot rescue your babies for the rest of their lives. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use you because you're my brother. Your mama, Carol, cannot come to you when you eating food at the dinner table with your wife and your children and say, baby, you got something on your mouth. Let mama get that for you. Did you, did you hear what I said? He is sitting at the dinner table, just for an example, with his, with his, with his wife with his children in the house he pays for. His mama can't come rescue him no more. There has to be something that has been taught by the parent that, that is sustaining the individual. The goal of every child should be to excel by the lessons taught of their parents. A delicate balance in both teaching and learning will benefit and equip the child in the tool of self-preservation. We got children that don't know what they're doing and they're 30. 
We got, we got, we got, we got grown mama's boys with kids that's still waiting on their mamas to do something for them. That, that time is up. There, there has to be, ladies, a clipping, a burning, a singeing of the apron springs. There has to be a release so that God can do with them. You, you, you know what you want. I know you want the best for your children. I, as fathers, we, we kind of different because the way we were raised and we think different. Let him go. Let him hurt himself. We, that, we done said that to you. And no, we're not mean for it. That's just our perspective. We're wired a different way because we understand how to learn by experience. You can say amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Or you can, you can just meet me in the parking lot. We'll talk a little bit later. We have here two miracles coincidentally interwoven here in Luke and in Matthew and in Mark. The first miracle was brought about by the persistence of a father who was in dire straits concerning the welfare of his daughter. The second miracle was brought about by a woman who had used all of her resources and had exhausted all of her options. The cure of the woman with the issue of blood offers us a perspective of dealing with issues where no one is there to help you. That father, because that daughter was not old enough, he, he was there to help. But this woman, they, she's identified not as a little girl, but as a woman with issues. She teaches us this, this, this vital message, and please pay attention to this, that our self-preserving time is limited. She teaches us, not only is your time limited, but your self-preserving ideas are limited. Not only is your self-preserving time limited and your self-preserving ideas limited, but your self-preserving resources are limited. She tried all kind of remedies. She, she spent all kind of money. She talked to all kind of doctors. Oh, that's a good idea. Let me try that. Oh, this ain't going to cost you that much. Let me try that. But after a while, all of your time, all of your ideas, all of your resources are going to dry up. Luke chapter 8 and verse 43, a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, which has spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any came behind Jesus and touched the border of his garment and immediately her issue of blood staunched. If and when dealing with a 12 year issue that it has built within it providential parental placement. Not only do you have providential parental placement but you have a self-preserving structure. Lastly, this is the most important one. You have the finishing touch. The finishing touch. Luke chapter 8 and verse 45. Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. I'll say this to you, and I want you to please pay attention to this. Uh, uh, your, your issues will do, will do either one of two things. It will get the best out of you, or it will work the fool out of you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And thank you, Jesus. That ain't the way I wrote it down, but that's the way it came out, so I'm going to give it to you right there. Signed, sealed, delivered. I'm yours. You are going to deal with your issues in one or two ways. You're going to deal with your issues privately, or you're going to deal with them publicly. Either way, as long as you deal with your issues, that is the bottom line. The raising of Jairus' daughter, uh, coming back to life, this was a public address made to Christ by a ruler, a person in opposition to Christ, who pleaded with Christ to save his daughter's life. Jairus made this request on behalf of his daughter that was very ill and at the point of death. This was a very humble and a very reverent request. Jairus thought 
though a ruler fell down at Jesus' feet, as owning him to be a ruler above him was very persistent. Here's the kicker. His faith was weak. Jairus' faith was weak because he was opposed to Christ. But he, he said that everybody else getting healed. And, and the common denominator in everybody else who comes to us to report that they no longer have to come to us to pay for penance is this man named Jesus. There was a blind man who was sitting at the gate called Beautiful who, who, who came in, uh, who came in the gate. He, was, he could not see. There was a lame man who, who now could walk. And if Jesus could do it for a blind man and a lame man, how, how much could he do for my daughter? So I'm going to take I'm going to take my pride as a father. I, I'm going to take my arrogance as a, as a ruler of the synagogue. And I'm, I'm going to put that to the side right now. Because right now what's more important is not my position, but it's not my possession. It is my, the, the placement of my parental authority. And I need to make sure that my daughter can live. Help me, Holy Ghost. His faith was weak, yet he believed Jesus could heal his daughter. The second uh, coincidence uh, uh, and providential statement in this text is the cure of the woman with an issue of blood. This was not a public address. This was a very secret address. For, for 12 years, Scripture tells us that she had this issue and that she walked around with this issue. Here it is. This issue kept her in a quiet place. This issue kept her in a shameful place. She could not come in public. She could not be around people. She could not touch folk because her issue kept her separated. So she determined in her mind, if I could just get to him and, and touch just, I don't have to talk to him he don't have to lay hands on me we don't have to get in the, in the river so I can be baptized if I can get to him and I can touch him I know I'll be made whole unlike Jairus the woman with the issue of blood her faith was strong and her faith got her to push through the crowd you understand when you lose blood it makes you weak somebody talk to him when, when you lose blood, it does something to your body. But she found enough strength. Her faith strengthened her enough that as she got to the crowd and the people were pressing in, she somehow got to where Jesus was. Here's her thinking. The people were present, were more likely, uh, more likely she thought, that she, she should be concealed. That the more people around, the less folk will see me and I can sneak my healing out of Jesus. Her faith was strong. Jesus stopped. He's on the way. Jairus has been on his knees. He, he's crying. He's, he's in his ruler of the synagogue outfit because he had to rush home from work. His daughter is dying. He got folk with him. They say, hey, hey, Jesus, listen. I know we were at odds not too long ago, but I need you to come heal my daughter. Here it is. Jesus decides, hey, I'll go to your house. Let's go. And on the way, the people said, hey, don't leave here. We need you here. And they pressed into it. Now, I want to paint this picture. I want to paint this picture that, that just, just think about this. What if everybody over here moved to the center? And, and everybody over here after a few moves, we're going to run out of seats. And, and here it is. Jesus is in the middle where Lamar is. Jesus is on the way to a destination, but you're comfortable because he's where you are. Might have catch that tomorrow. You're, you're comfortable because the church tells you that where I am, Jesus is. And here it is. He says, I'll go to Jairus' house. And the people pressed in, wait. Don't leave without healing me. Wait, don't leave without seeing about me, but I'm going to Jairus' house. And wait, don't, don't leave. I got issues too. Deal with my issues. Don't leave. Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to Jairus' house. I got a mission. And as Jesus began to take steps, this woman, some kind of way, finagles herself up through the crowd of grown men and grown women and, and other folk with children and, and folk with issues in some kind of way. She found the strength to press through, to get to the, not to the top, not to touch the anointing on his head. 
not to feel the power in his hands. But if, as she got low enough, she touched the hem of his garment, and Jesus stopped. And he asked, who touched me? That's the problem that I have with that text is she didn't touch him. She touched the hem. She, she didn't. You, you can tell if somebody, t if you, okay, you ever been on Martyr doing one of these Atlanta functions? You are all, I'm the CIA. I'm on high alert. Don't get close to me. It's not a good move. It's just not a good move. And, and you know, people get in close proximity. It makes you very uncomfortable. Here it is. She didn't touch him, but she got close enough to tag his clothes and let go. And the Bible says the moment she touched the hem of his garment, her issue of blood stopped. Not only did her issue stop, ladies and gentlemen, but Jesus himself stopped. He said, who touched me? Peter said, come on, Lord, do you see all these people? You see this little bitty roll, all these people, and you in the middle, everybody touching you. He said, no. He said, somebody touched me who needed to touch me. He said, somebody got to me who, see, see, here's my thing. I don't think folk as desperate to get to God as we used to be. I, I think some kind of way we become so comfortable in our Christianity that we're no longer desperate to get to the Savior. We're just eager to get to church. We're waiting on our three songs and a message, but we don't want to get to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And thank you, Jesus. I say it for you. Or out. Jesus wanted to know who touched him. My question was, was it the issue of the little girl or was it the grown woman with an issue? Here's my other question. What was so coincidental about this 12-year issue these ladies seemed to share? What was so providential about them receiving their healing around the same time frame? Same time frame. Same time frame. I got all tongue tied. The little girl, please pay attention to this. The little girl was identified as 12 years old. According to the Jewish custom, the word mitzvah is command, commandment in both Hebrew and Aramaic. Under the Jewish law, children are not obligated to observe the commandments until they reach a certain age. Children are encouraged to learn the obligations they will have as adults. But children become obligated to observe the commandments, boys age 13, girls age 12. Bar mitzvah. Bar, B-A-R, means son. It means son. Bat mitzvah, B-A-T, means daughter in Hebrew. This literally means the son of the commandment. Bat mitzvah, bar mitzvah, son and daughter of the commandments. They are now responsible to observe commandments. Stay with me. Our text presents us two ladies, one of age to be observe the issue uh, and, and she has an issue of life. The other beyond age, and she has an issue of blood. You have two ladies, one of age to begin to observe, and she has an issue of life, and one beyond age of, of observation, and she has an issue of blood. The one of age to observe the commandment fell sick, short of reaching the full level of responsibility of keeping the commandments. Here it is in text, she was supported by a father. This, this makes a difference, please pay attention. A father who went beyond himself, his position, his, his pride to get to Jesus. A father who invited Jesus into his home. A father who begged Jesus publicly to come to a private situation and heal his daughter. 
Her glass was half full, yet she still had an issue. Secondly, you have the one beyond age, the age of observation. She lived in isolation and shame for 12 years. She supported herself. She reasoned within herself. She searched for Jesus herself. She slipped in amongst a huge crowd. She touched the hem of Christ's garment and tried to disappear. Her glass was half empty and she still had an issue. I want to share a story. I normally do this at the beginning, but it made more sense to put it at the end. One day, a psychologist walks into a room. She walks into a room, she grabs a, a, a picture of water and pours it into a glass. Not full, not a third, not three fourths, but half. She poured the water halfway in the glass and everybody in the room, just like you are, was, going, was expecting her to ask, is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? To everybody's surprise, she didn't ask that question. She asked this question, how heavy is the glass? Silence fell across the room. As silence fell across the room, people began to guesstimate. About eight ounces, 20 ounces, 16 ounces. She said this to the crowd. It doesn't matter how heavy the glass is. The weight of the glass is going to stay the same. How long you hold the glass is going to determine how heavy the glass is. If you hold it for a day, you may be able to do that. I've held this for the entire message, approximately 35 minutes. Not a problem at all. Shifted hands juggled it around, not a problem. If I hold it for a week, it might be a bit of a struggle. If I hold it for a year, after a while, my arm is going to become stiff, paralyzed. This glass of water is good if I drink it, but if I just hold it, it does me no good. This is just like your issue. Some of us have been holding this issue for five years, 20 years, 30 years. I'm just finding I got issues that are 40 years old. The truth of the matter is, drinking your issues won't make you feel any better. The only way to deal with your issues is to get rid of them. You are the only person who holds your issues. Nobody else. You have to let go. I have to let go. A 12 year issue can be ended when you decide to let it go. Father, thank you. Bless you. Thank you for being a savior. Thank you for being a God. Thank you, God, that some of us had a life that was okay. Can't complain. And when we look at it, we can say our glass was half full. Some of us can look at our lives and look at the things that we went through and, and dislike most of them and say, God, our, our glasses are half empty. Fill me. But you say to us, don't bottle you up. Don't lock you in. Don't put you in a position that you are not free to do what you will with our lives. God, open us up. Pour us out. And fill us with you, with your presence. God, today I simply thank you for every issue that has brought us to this place. Thank you for every moment, every disappointment every frustration that has put in us what we have at this place.
God don't allow us to have head knowledge and book knowledge and, and, and a semi-knowledge of who you are and not move on what we know. But God, now give us the balance of the word. You said that from a child we've known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation, but knowing the Scripture and applying the Scripture to our lives are two totally different things. God, I praise you for giving us wisdom on how to walk, on how to release, on how to walk away, on how to deal with our issues so that we are free to live the life that you declare. God, we are the only obstacle in our own way. Our thoughts, our, our decisions, our plans. But God, thank you for being providential in our coincidental moments. And we know that all things, both coincidentally and providentially, work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to your purpose. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for blessing your people. Thank you for giving us release from our issues so that we can be who you've destined us to be. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.